Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So, uh, well, thank you everyone for uh, coming in early uh, on a rainy morning for this uh, exciting session. So this topic is uh, bridging virtualization and security with OpenStack and Contrail. And I will be, so the format is uh, I will be talking for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then uh, I'm actually going to give a quick demo of uh, some security services that uh, we can dynamically spin up on top of uh, our um, open SDN controller, uh, open Contrail, and open stack. And then uh, my colleagues, uh, Shui and uh, Anikit, will be leading the hands-on session and walk you through exactly how you do uh, service chaining for security services. So uh, we welcome you to uh, interact with us. So uh, you're welcome to tweet and uh, join our LinkedIn group and visit our opencontrol.org website. So basically, our SDN controller is integrated with, with OpenStack and is completely open sourced. So we welcome uh, developers to participate in the development. So um, in um, Chinese, the word crisis has two characters. Uh, the first character, Wei, means a time of danger. And the second character, Ji, means opportunity. So the Chinese understand that changes are an inevitable. And when change happens, it brings both danger and opportunities. And you're either energized or demoralized, depending on whether you see the opportunities or you just see the danger. So uh, what's my point here? So we are in um, the forefront of a revolution towards uh, cloud and virtualization. And that actually brings a lot of uh, complexities and, like, and uh, challenges to the way we deploy security. And if you were in some of the previous sessions in this summit, you've heard a lot about what kind of challenges cloud and virtualization has brought to the security architecture. So um, I'll just list uh, some of them here. So first of all, um, cloud and virtualization was driven by dynamic applications. And they, in turn, enabled applications to be more dynamic. So when I say dynamic, what I mean is uh, actually it's twofold. The first uh, dimension of uh, dynam dynamic application is uh, the applications can really shrink and uh, grow in a momentary notice. So um, to give you an example, um, back in 2012, this, uh, this is Zynga. So Alec Baldwin was on the plane and uh, he refused to turn off his smartphone or tablet because he wants to play the Dinga game, Words with Friends. And then uh, once the news broke out, there was like record traffic on Zynga website trying to play the game. So the application can really grow very fast, unexpectedly. And the second dimension is actually the rate of uh, innovation that's happening in the develop software development space. So with uh, agile development, we have, you're very familiar with uh, the DevOps. So the DevOps team need to spin up dynamic environment to test and release the software like several times a day. And these uh, application environments may have different security implementation, impl implications and security requirements. So um, for security that's very static, it's not going to catch up with uh, the new requirement posed by the dynamic applications. So security must change along with uh, the applications. And uh, the second uh, challenge is uh, workload mobility. So even within one data center, you know, like due to uh, high availability requirements and uh, the need to meet uh, SLA, SLA requirements, and also for disaster recovery. 
workloads may move around within your, uh, the same data center or even across different data centers. So uh, the traditional way of doing security, so security must be always on in the new era. And also, it must be in lockstep with your mobile workload. And last but not least, so in a virtualized cloud data center, we are seeing uh, an increasing amount of uh, east-west traffic, which is traffic um, like between your virtual machines in your data center. Um, so according to statistics, more than 80% of the data center traffic is actually in your data center between your virtual machines versus uh, less than 20% is actually going in and out of your data centers. So, oh, sorry. So um, what that means, uh, the security, the data center security must be more granular. So now, if you only have a parameter-based security, you have a firewall at the edge of your data center, that would not work. Because uh, either you have to divert all your traffic like inter data, like inter data center to the parameter and back, which caused huge inefficiency, or these uh, communication, these traffic just evade your security protection. They won't go through any firewall and protection anymore. So those are the challenges that uh, security, uh, that virtualization and cloud are posing on the security architecture. But we are arguing that at the same time, they are actually bringing huge opportunities for security to do a better job. So um, in order to show you um, where the opportunities are, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the key things that enable security to do its job. So um, for security to be efficient, we need both contact and security. So by contact, I mean uh, application contact. Uh, the environment the applications are running in, for example, the information about the application, whether it's the Oracle database and whether it's your web server, uh, the vendor information, what operating system and the file system, and also how much storage I need and uh, what's my CPU usage. And with these, it's kind of like um, um, you have a better knowledge of what the applications require from the architecture. So you can do better security and protection. And the other uh, thing that's really contributing to good security is isolation. So basically, um, by isolation, I mean the security function itself ideally should be isolated from the entities that it is protecting. So for example, you don't want uh, a host-based security, and uh, when the host in, is infiltra infiltrated, the security can be easily disabled. If the, like, your antivirus software can be easily disabled, then it doesn't achieve your purpose of doing good protection. And traditionally, security has been struggling to achieve both. Because uh, for host-based security, it has very good context. It understands what applications are running in um, this environment, and it understands what applications and uh, the, the file system and everything. But it doesn't have good isolation, just like what I said. Um, an attacker can easily relatively easily disable the antivirus software if it already took control of the host. Um, likewise, traditionally, network-based security has very good isolation because it doesn't run on the same host, doesn't run on the same uh, entity as uh, the applications they're protecting. They're in the network. So uh, they're isolated from the applications, but it has been challenging for network-based security to get the contacts information. But they do need the, the application contacts to be more efficient. Uh, to give you an example, if you have uh, some UTM sy system or a firewall, it might need to go through um, 
like tens of thousands of signatures, wasting a lot of CPU cycles to be able to like find out which signature this attacker actually matches. But if it actually knows that, oh, I'm running Oracle server, then it can actually narrow down the number of signatures that it needs to match and maybe reduce it down to hundreds instead of tens of thousands. So knowing the application contact can make security much more efficient. So um, we argue that uh, in the era of uh, virtualization and uh, cloud, we actually have uh, all the conditions that we can actually do um, security much better. So we can actually have security that knows both uh, the contact and also have very good isolation. So uh, what do I mean by that? So at the host level, right now uh, with uh, server virtualization, so you have a, a hypervisor layer that's separated from uh, your application environment, which is running in your virtual machines. So um, if you're protecting your applications, then the hypervisor layer, the security that's implemented in the hypervisor layer has very good isolation. And because they're on the host, they already have very good application contact. Now with security, they actually gain more isolation. So it's harder for the attackers to get to the hypervisor level to actually disable the security. So uh, similarly for uh, network-based security, traditionally we are challenged with uh, getting the application contact. But um, with uh, software-defined networking, so we actually have uh, essentially, um, we have uh, uh, a, a logically centralized uh, SDN controller that actually has your information of all your virtual networks. So it actually uh, provides, along with OpenStack, it provides much better programmability. And the users can actually easily convey uh, its policy requirements, its uh, security requirements through a policy-driven framework that's enabled by SDN and network virtualization. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to use uh, uh, Contrail and uh, OpenStack to give you an example of uh, how we make this happen. So uh, first, a quick uh, introduction of Contrail. So basically, uh, Contrail, uh, I use inter interchangeably with uh, Open Contrail because uh, it's uh, an open source project. It's an open source SDN controller and cloud networking virtualization orchestration and automation software that's led by Juniper. But now uh, we have seen um, pretty rapid adoption in the open source, secu uh, open source community. Until now, we have contributed um, more than 750,000 lines of code into the open source community. And uh, so we have uh, seen uh, uh, huge adoptions among service providers and enterprises like, um, alike. And uh, we have about uh, 130 proof of concept and uh, deployment. Um, and among them, 90% uh, of all top service providers in the world actually have uh, done proof of concept with Contrail for their SDN and cloud and NFV projects. Uh, so, um, Architecture-wise, at the bottom of uh, um, the, the stack, we have a network virtualization. So basically, this is your plumbing. And uh, traditionally, this has been done with VLAN and where you need to deal with uh, broadcast storms and uh, restrictions on number of VLAN IDs and a lot of scaling issues. And, uh, so Juniper, along with some other leading vendors in SDN, we adopt uh, a software virtual, a software overlay approach that removed the restrictions that VLAN has. 
So you can actually uh, dynamically spin up virtual networks. So these virtual networks can also represent the different security requirements that your applications have. So if uh, a group of your applications or a certain part of your multi-tier application, they have specific security requirement, you can put them in um, the same uh, virtual machine group or uh, endpoint group so that uh, they can be protected with a set of uh, different a set of individual policies. And uh, the next layer up, we actually have uh, a set of uh, virtualized uh, network services. So, uh, you know, like Juniper has traditionally been pretty strong and we have a suite of uh, virtualized security services that we can run on our SDN platform that includes our Firefly parameter, which is uh, a firewall product and uh, also uh, an anti-DDoS product called uh, DDoS Secure. And we also have, uh, have web application security and also uh, SSL VPN that we can run and we actually have a demo uh, of running them over Contrio platform. And uh, because uh, Contrio is uh, open source and open standard, a very open platform, we can actually easily enable third party security and network services to be running on top of Contrio. So if you're interested in developing such a service, uh, uh, if we have time at the end, uh, we'll show you how to um, pull the source trace rule dev stack. And uh, on top of that, we have the, the SDN control layer and configuration layer. And so uh, this layer uh, is composed of uh, a centralized, logically centralized SDN controller that talks to distributed forwarding element that's embedded in your compute node, which are normally your physical servers. So uh, we have, uh, similar to uh, the open virtual switch, we have a V router that's running in the hypervisor level. So we support a suite of hypervisors like KVM and Zen and ESXi and Hyper-V in the, in the future. And so what the controller does is uh, it actually, um, accept user configuration. So uh, through OpenStack, you can have a self-service portal where you can configure virtual networks and uh, uh, through another uh, control API, you can actually do uh, some additional more network focused activities like you can configure a service template and do dynamic service chaining. So uh, control SDN controller takes all this information and then um, pass that down, do its processing, and pass that down to the, the distributed forwarding element. And then on top of that, we can in, integrate with uh, cloud manage, management platforms like OpenStack and CloudStack, uh, but also uh, in a service provider environment, we can also integrate with uh, their OSS BSS. And one thing that stand out for Contrio is uh, we have a very good uh, um, statistics and uh, analytics information about the infrastructure. So um, the good thing that it, it can do with uh, the service provisioning is uh, with uh, this information, with this rich set of information, you can actually figure out what additional things you need to do with the service and you can actually uh, provision the service better. For example, if you provision one virtual machine running a firewall and uh, suddenly your application footprint increased and you need to increase your firewall footprint, you can actually detect that through your CPU utilization or your throughput and that can be fed back to um, your cloud management system and uh, your SDN controller and OpenStack can in turn spin up more virtual machines and automatically scale your security operation to actually meet the demand of your application needs. So um, this is just a, a, an, a, an architecture diagram of uh, the components in Contrail. So I already mentioned some of this. So, um, uh, at the compute level, so um, over here, let me see, how do I? 
I actually don't know how I get that little red dot. But these two are my compute nodes, so I can have multiple virtual machines running on top of that. That's my workload that I need to protect. And um, uh, I have a V router that's running um, in, at the hypervisor level. And uh, at the V router level, because uh, one of the differentiation of Contrail is uh, for V router, we actually, um, it's a layer three entity versus uh, open virtual switch, which is a layer two entity. So as a layer three entity, we can actually have much richer functionalities. We can actually do load balancing and uh, even some firewall functionalities and security functionalities and some NAT functionalities at the hypervisor level without uh, introducing another virtual machine for your routing and uh, other security functions so that the performance is much better when you need communication between different uh, virtual networks. And uh, so these are the, the vRouter uh, is the distributed uh, forwarding element. And uh, on top of that, we have the, um, the SDN controller. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we use an overlay approach to uh, realize uh, the virtual networks and uh, um, your uh, tenants and multi-tenancy. So um, we actually are physical uh, network agnostic. So uh, we don't really care what uh, switch fabric you use. It can be Juniper's uh, Q fabric, it can be Cisco's UCS, and it can be Brocade, or it can be a mixed environment. And because uh, we establish overlay tunnels on top of that, um, you don't need to rip and replace your existing data center infrastructure to enjoy the benefit that we can bring. And we tightly integrate with OpenStack for uh, cloud orchestration. So this is a list of some of the key features that we support. I already mentioned some of this. So at the forwarding element level, we already support uh, uh, load balancing and uh, um, security. So security is actually built in to our design because the virtual networks are inherently secure. So um, you can, the virtual machines within the same virtual network can talk to each other, um, but uh, without any uh, additional work done, um, virtual machines in different networks, they are very separated from each other and they don't share any information unless you establish a policy to uh, connect them through a service, a security service. So um, also service chaining. So uh, we actually made service chaining really easy. So I'm going to show you a quick demo uh, in a moment. Um, okay, so uh, the last slide I'm going to have uh, just talks about how we actually map the logical infrastructure to your physical infrastructure. So uh, the physical infrastructure, you can have multiple compute nodes with multiple virtual machines on running on top of them. So the infrastructure I want to build, the logical infrastructure I want to build is on the top. So I want to build, for example, three virtual networks, the green, the blue, and the yellow. And then I want to be able to connect them with uh, certain security features. I want to connect these two with a firewall and those with uh, uh, deep packet inspection. So how are they done? So these virtual machines can be anywhere in your data center. It's not restricted by the VLAN cluster or anything um, in our implementation. So um, what we do is we establish overlay. Um, it, it can be MPOs over GRE, MPOs over UDP or VXLAN tunnels to connect these uh, uh, virtual machines together and then chain the, the firewall service in between. So the av advantage of this approach is uh, um, we can deal with workload movement. So this can be movement of uh, the, the firewall instance is itself. It's a, it's a virtual machine itself. Or uh, it can be the workload that you're protecting. They can move around. And uh, the control SDN controller can actually dynamically update the tunnel based on the movement because it understands, with, along with OpenStack, it understands where the workload has moved to. And it can dynamically adjust tunnel to make sure that the security service is always 
uh, on and in lockstep with your workload. And the other advantage is, uh, so um, it's about uh, auto scaling. So basically, uh, with uh, the rich analytics we can bring, we can actually detect whether there is a need to scale up or scale down your firewall services. And we can automatically get that done. And uh, because at the vRouter level, we can actually do uh, load balancing at the high provider level. So if we scale up your uh, firewall services from one to four, we can automatically load balance among these four instances. So giving you much higher capacity. So uh, I think that's uh, the talking part. And uh, so um, with virtualization and uh, the cloud management, we can actually easily make security very dynamic, very scalable, and very pervasive in your data center. And uh, with that, I'm going to show you uh, a quick demo of uh, our DDoS Secure over Contrail and how that can um, help you uh, mitigate DDoS attacks. So um, let me see if I can make this window a little bigger. So this is your usual, um, oh no. So this is your usual uh, OpenStack interface. And uh, we also have a, a control UI. So um, basically, um, they use the same set of underlying information. But uh, with the control UI, you can have uh, some more advanced uh, networking functionalities. So uh, what I do is I'm going to uh, spin up two virtual networks. So one, um, I can use these two uh, interchangeably. So uh, I'm going to spin up two networks. One is uh, the attacker network, uh, DDoS attacker net. And I give it an IP address. 24. So this is how easy um, I can create a virtual network. And uh, so I'm going to create another one called DDoS uh, target network. So this is uh, where um, my web server or the entities I want to protect, this is where they're going to reside. Um, actually, I accidentally, so I'm going to change that later. And so while I'm at uh, OpenStack, I'm going to spin up a virtual machine in each of my virtual networks. So one is going to be the attacker, and the other one is going to be the target I'm going to attack. So uh, I put it in my attacker network. And then um, I'm going to launch another instance um, to be my target. So now uh, I'm actually going to uh, switch to my uh, control UI so that uh, I can uh, do my dynamic service chaining. So um, here I'm going to configure uh, a service template. DDoS. So it's going to be a transparent service, meaning it's a layer two service uh, that and uh, so I choose uh, my service image. 
And then I'm going to have three interfaces. The left interface connect to my attacker, and right interface connect to my um, target. And I have a manage management interface where I can see um, the statistics about my DDoS attack. So with that uh, service, plate, uh, service template, I can actually spin up multiple uh, service instances. So I'm going to do one now, DDoS service instance. So I'm going to pick my, the, the template I just picked, and I'm going to put my management in the public network so I can access through a browser. And I leave the left and right as auto-configured. So this will actually take uh, a minute of two. So basically what this is doing is uh, OpenStack is spinning up a virtual machine to run my um, anti-DDoS software image. And um, after that, I'll set up uh, a policy to, so, oh, it's actually really fast. It's active now. Um, so then I'm going to set up a security policy to uh, direct the traffic from attacker network to um, the target network to go through my um, DDoS secure service instance. So this is doing the service chaining. DDoS policy. So um, from in like source network would be my uh, attacker network and uh, destination network would be my target network, so I can apply a service. Uh, that's a service instance I just created. And then once the policy is created, I'm going to apply it to both my attacker and uh, my target network. So I can select my DDoS policy that I just created and save. And so I removed because I accidentally added this. So I apply the DDoS policy here. So now uh, I go back to my um, attacker virtual machine. So I log on. I need to log on to the console and see if I can access uh, my target so that I can issue some uh, attacks. So um, I have config. So uh, for my attacker, I have an IP address of uh, 192.168.100.253. And my target has an IP address of 101.253. So I'm going to do a quick ping to make sure that I can access my target. So now the ping can go through. So I'm, now I'm going to launch my attacks. So um, as some of you uh, who are very familiar with security, I think nowadays uh, DDoS attacks are getting more and more sophisticated. So traditionally we see a lot of uh, like TCP sync attacks, those like flooding attacks. But recently there are more and more slow loris types of uh, attacks that actually uh, really um, exploit uh, the application uh, defects. Uh, so basically, for example, they're opening up uh, TCP sockets, but they don't close it. So your, your web server can quickly run out of resources. So I'm actually going to uh, launch two types of attacks. So I'm going to use HPing3 to launch a TCP sync like flooding attack. So dash s means uh, it's a TCP sync attack. So I launch it on port 80, which is uh, my web server do a flood and the IP address. So I put that in the background and uh, then I'm going to launch a slow loris attack. So this is just a Perl script, Perl slow loris.pl, uh, DNS, oh no. Hope my connection is okay. Let me 
me see. I think the, the network connection is uh, somewhat slow. So if this, um, I can't complete this demo, I can always blame on the network. I blame on the wireless network. <laughs> Not on the fact somebody's trying to do a DDoS attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I see some life. <laughs> Attacker VM. And go back. Okay. Um, so DNS is 192.168.101.253, and port is 80. So as you can see, uh, it's building socket on the, the web server, my uh, target. And then if we go back to the instances, you can see um, this is my DDoS service instance. And because I put the, the public, uh, I, I put the management interface in the public network, so I can actually log on to this to see the attack. Let me see the address again. 10.1.3.162. Yeah, so I'll be done in a minute or two. So once we see uh, the attacks. One dot ten dot one dot three dot one sixty two. Okay. So this is uh, our DDoS secure device manager. So it has a dashboard to show you to let you configure uh, DDoS secure, and also it can show you some uh, live attacks that we detected. So from the dashboard, as you can see, we're already seeing um, like traffic spikes at uh, the DDoS Secure um, device. And uh, so this one actually shows uh, the CPU usage. So the CPU usage also spiked up, and uh, this is the attack level. So we already detected the attack. And you can also see that through um, live incidents. Oh, actually, let me see worst offenders. No, sorry. Um, live incidents. So as you can see, the top one has a very high traffic rate. So this is your TCP SYNC attack. And uh, this one over here, the second one, in the, the traffic rate is very slow. So this is your slow Loris attack. So the DDoS secure service actually detected both. And from here, you can see we're in logging mode. So we're not really mitigating the attack. So we're basically just logging the attacks. And what I can do is uh, I can configure my DDoS secure to um, do uh, mitigation. So I put it in defending mode. Um, then you see that uh, actually all the traffic, all the attack traffic will be dropped. So now uh, I have changed to defending mode. And you can see the amount of traffic coming into the DDoS secure, it's still quite huge. But the outgoing traffic is going 
to be zero pretty soon. Uh, because uh, I, the, the DDoS security service dropped out the uh, attack traffic. And so now your target, your web server or whatever application will be protected. So uh, that ends my demo. And I'm going to invite my coworkers, uh, Shui and uh, Anikit, to uh, lead you through a hands-on session where you can do some of these things yourself. Thanks, Chloe. <coughs> So uh, we'll get into the hands-on part of the session. Each of you should have received two handouts, one uh, which, uh, which goes over the lab exercises that we're going to go through today, and the other one is a sandbox information. If you haven't received one, please raise your hands. We'll come and help you. So you need this. Uh, Are, um, we do these hands-on exercises in a lab, and the lab is behind a VPN. So uh, the handout contains the URL that you point your browser to to connect to that VPN and then log in using the login information. And then there is a little client that you'll have to download. It's a Java applet that you'll have to download. Um, once you log into the VPN, there's a Start button. When you click on the Start button, you'll either download a Juno's Pulse or a Network Connect applet. And once you download, that's when you actually get connected to the VPN. And once you are connected to the VPN, um, you can point your browser to the 10.10.11.11 or 10.10.11.16 uh, URLs. Those are the URLs to the um, OpenStack and the Contrail instance that is running in the lab. So we also have a raffle draw towards the end of the session. Folks who will complete the exercise will be, uh, you know, uh, we'll do a raffle drawing for them, and there's an iPad giveaway at the end of the session. So good luck. So I'll spend um, three or four minutes waiting for everyone to get connected to the VPN. If you have any issues connecting to the VPN, you may raise your hands, and we can help you get connected. Once we are connected, we'll go. Uh, we'll do a very quick overview of the architecture, and then get on to the hands uh, hands on um, as soon as possible. It never moved anywhere. <laughs> no. Yeah, it should be good.
same same password. Be the same password. It's not, why is it not uh, taking it? So, so let me uh, do the same thing on um, my screen here to quickly show you how it should look like. So this is exactly what uh, I did. I pointed my browser to the OpenLab URL, uh, the 63119251102. I logged in using Chloe has her own credentials to the Open Lab, so she logged in using her credentials, and then you hit start, and that downloads the Java applet, and then that's how you get connected to the VPN. And, and this should be running to tell you that you are connected to the VPN. All right. So let me spend uh, a few minutes talking about doing a quick recap of the Contrail architecture. And, and the goal is not to uh, deep dive into the architecture itself. It's only to set context uh, for the exercise. So you can see uh, it's nicely organized into four layers. The four layers that you saw earlier in Chloe's slides, uh, this maps to the same four layers. At the top, you have uh, the cloud orchestration, and we are all familiar with OpenStack. So th the topmost layer is the uh, OpenStack layer with which you will interface with the system. The next layer, uh, there are two components that Contrail provides. There are two pieces of software that Contrail provides, the controller and the vRouter software. So the controller software is the next layer. And the vRouter is a kernel loadable module that instantiates into the hypervisor of each of the compute node where your VMs are going to hang off of. So that's the next layer you can see, um, the vRouter and the controller software. The controller itself is comprised of three different software modules, uh, the, the control piece, the um, config piece, and the analytics piece. So the config piece is responsible for translation of the high level uh, abstract definition of your overlay picture and translates that into the lower, la lo lower, layer, lower level data model and um, speaks and, and hands over that data model to the control. And the control then speaks XMPP to the vRouters and uh, programs the vRouter to instantiate that picture in the overlay. Uh, you describe the picture of the overlay you want to see in the using the uh, orchestrator software. And then um, each piece, each component of this system uh, sends a, a bunch of analytics information, and all that analytics information is uh, dumped into highly available databases. And uh, we will see in the Contrail UI how you can retrieve those analytics information about the flow and records and um, also about the log messages. Um, underneath the overlay, underneath the overlay is the physical underlay. So the physical underlay is uh, provides any-to-any -any IP connectivity within your data center. So remember, your virtual machines are hanging off of these x86 compute nodes, x86 servers, and the underlay provides any-to-any -any, any -any IP reachability between these servers. And the only thing Contrail expects from the underlay is this IP reachability, and it does not, uh, there is no other expectation from the physical underlay. So that's the beauty of, um, that's the beauty of the Contrail solution. Um, so fundamental to network virtualization, so Contrail is a network virtualization uh, platform, and fundamental to network virtualization is this um, idea of being able, to gi being able to give the tenants of the cloud the illusion of having a logically isolated network from isolated from rest of the tenants. And in a private cloud, a tenant is a department. In a public cloud, a tenant is a customer of the cloud. So, so fundamental to network virtualization is this idea of being able to give the illusion of isolation from rest of the tenants uh, of the cloud. So, so that's the fundamental. And, and this, this network isolation, the building block of this network isolation is the concept of a virtual network. And, in, and, and for Contrail, we build these virtual networks using overlays, uh, as opposed to some other solutions where you could have used VLANs, but there are uh, several issues in using VLANs, and we will not go over the issues in using VLANs because the focus of this uh, session is to do the hands-on. So, Remember that um, 
virtual networks are implemented in the contrail world using overlays. And uh, so, so the tunnels that you see in the picture, these tunnels between the V routers and from the V router to the physical uh, gateway, these tunnels are um, what are used to implement the overlays. And um, the gateway, the gateway is, could be a physical router or it could be a software router that is used to exit the data center, go from the virtual to the physical world, or to go from the data center out to the internet. So that's the role of the gateway. And that's all we need to do, that's all we need to know for, uh, to set the context for the demo uh, and the hands-on exercises. And, and this is another uh, nice slide that explains you uh, the, the virtual networks you are instantiating and then the virtual machines that you spawn inside these virtual networks, what the logical picture looks like that's uh, represented at the top. And in terms of how that, um, how that logical picture actually gets instantiated in the physical world, that's the bottom diagram that's, that's shown. So what we have in the, top, uh, in the top diagram, there are three different virtual networks. There are some virtual machines hanging off of these virtual networks. And then there are two services. There's one service, there's a firewall service between the green and the blue network. And there is a DPI service between the uh, blue and the yellow network. And these services themselves are also instantiated inside of virtual machines. So these are virtualized services, um, also called network function virtualization. So these are virtualized services themselves deployed inside virtual machines. So you can see all of these virtual machines, there are two compute nodes in this diagram. So all of these virtual machines are spawned on these two compute nodes. And if, if there's traffic being sent, um, so virtual machines belonging to the same network, the green one and the green three, you can see are sitting on two different compute nodes. And the tunnel is established to uh, extend the network from the left host to the right host. So, so the tunnels are used to extend the network to, to, to create the concept of the virtual network. So that's the essential idea you need to take away from this slide. So we saw that demo, and now um, for the hands-on, uh, this is sort of the agenda what we'll be going over in the hands-on exercises. So the fundamental building block is the virtual network. So the first thing that we will see in the hands-on is how do you create a virtual network? And then you spawn virtual machines, and then put the VNICs of these virtual machines in the virtual network that you spawn. So, uh, that's the next step we will see. We will spawn virtual machines inside these virtual networks. So these virtual machines will hang off of those virtual networks. And then uh, the other fundamental uh, building block of um, network virtualization is the, is, that, is the idea of isolation. So you will see that in a virtual network, the virtual machines can talk among themselves but traffic cannot exit the virtual network or um, traffic from other virtual networks cannot enter the virtual, uh, that virtual network. So in order to allow traffic to exit and enter the virtual network, you have to actually apply policy. So we will see the application of policy and then attachment of that policy. Now, this policy can be a stateless um, ACL-like policy. And therefore, we also have richer and um, more stateful um, uh, policies that can be applied. And that is what is uh, called a service insertion. So we will see one example of service insertion. We saw one example of service insertion in uh, Chloe's demo. We saw the DDoS secure being inserted as a service. In, in our hands-on exercise, we will see a NAT gateway being inserted. So Juniper has this virtualized, um, virtualized service instance called the Junos v Firefly. And we've already pre-programmed this Firefly to perform the NAT function and that image has been added to the Glance repository and is available in your OpenStack instances uh, that's running in the OpenLab um, open lab, uh, lab. And so we will take uh, this NAT instance and we will instantiate it uh, between two networks. So we will see that. We will see the concept of floating IP and how that, that gets uh, um, used. The third exercise, we can do the DDoS secure um, ourselves. We saw Chloe doing the demonstration, and you can do it for yourself. You can do the exact same demo. We have the instructions in your handout. 
And the fourth exercise, finally, is the rich amount of debug and analytics information. How do you get access to that? How, how do you attach packet analyzers? How do you attach Wireshark um, to your virtual networks or your virtual machines? How do you do that? So that's, um, and instructions for all these exercises are available in your handouts. So the first demo where we will insert the NAT gateway, essentially, um, let's, say there is, uh, let's say there is an enterprise network. So when you create a virtual network, you will assign some private IP block to it. And then uh, clearly it won't have routes to reach the external internet. But there is another network, there's a public network which we, which we have pre-created which has routes to reach the internet. And therefore, for this, pub, uh, for this private block of IP addresses that the enterprise network uh, has, in order for the, enterprise, for the VMs spawned in the enterprise network to be able to reach the internet, you have to apply the NAT service because routes to the internet are available for the public network. So if you apply the NAT service in between the enterprise and the public network, then the VMs in the enterprise network will be able to reach the internet. So, so that's essentially the demo we'll do. The public network already exists. We've already created. It has routes to the uh, external internet. Um, the enterprise network is what we will create. We will spawn one virtual machine inside the enterprise network. We will then apply policy, and then we will insert the Firefly NAT service uh, between, these, uh, between these two virtual networks. So all traffic going from the enterprise network will be forced through the NAT service, the NAT service will be applied, and then by virtue of that NAT service, access to the internet will be enabled. So that's the demo we are going to, that's the hands-on we are going to do. So as I said, the public network already exists. And the first step is to create the enterprise network. So in order to create the enterprise network, you can use either the OpenStack Horizon UI or the Contrail Web UI. So let me introduce you to the two UIs first. So in Chloe's demo, we also uh, saw both the UIs, but uh, mostly we will, for the purpose of this demo, everything that's, that's to do with spawning of virtual machines, we will do from the OpenStack Horizon UI, and everything that's got to do with networking, whether it's creation of networks or application of policy or spawning of service instances, we will do from the Contrail UI. Um, so uh, there, are three, there are three data centers in the lab that we've created for the purpose of this exercise. So I'm connected to one of them, 10, 10, 11, 11, and I'm, that's my Horizon uh, dashboard. And then on the, on the same IP address at the port 8080, you can connect to the Contrail UI. Now, everybody is familiar with the OpenStack UI, so let me spend like half a minute introducing the Contrail UI. So there are four tabs in the Contrail UI. There is a monitor tab, the um, operational you know, aspect of uh, a Contrail controller can be uh, seen from the monitor tab. The interesting thing to note, note here is that there are five servers. And on these five, uh, among these five servers, there are two V routers. When I say there are two V routers, uh, it means there are two compute nodes. And within these compute nodes, uh, two V routers have been instantiated. And so on these two compute nodes, all the virtual machines are going to be spawned. And then you saw the Contrail controller comprises of three different nodes, the config, the config control and analytics. So, so that's, my, um, that's my controller running on uh, the three remaining three servers. So once again, I have five servers in, my, in, my, in, in this data center. Two of them are designated as compute nodes where V routers are instantiated. And the remaining three, I've distributed my control config and analytics nodes uh, to run my controller. So the idea is that the controller is logically centralized and physically distributed. And for, for scale and redundancy and high availability, you can instantiate uh, each component, whether it's the control or config, on uh, as many nodes as you want uh, for the purposes of high availability and redundancy. So here I've instantiated two control nodes for the purpose of redundancy. Um, and then each of these components, I can you can drill down, and then it shows you some information about the CPU consumption and the memory, and 
um, each of these nodes I can drill down and then the color and the size of the bubble has its obvious meaning. If it's green, it means it's all good. If it's pink or red, it has um, something fuzzy going on. Um, so that's the monitor dashboard. And similarly, you can look at the networks that you've already spawned. So it lists all the networks and then it can, so Chloe just created this DDoS attacker net. So, so look at this um, nice web 2.0 UI, which shows you exactly what Chloe did. She created a DDoS attacker network, and she created a DDoS target network, and then she, she launched or, or, or inserted the DDoS secure service instance. And so it shows you a nice pictorial. This is a simple, um, you know, this is a simple topology, but you, know, you can have more complex topology, and then you can easily visualize them. Uh, in this monitored uh, UI. Similarly, you have the, the debug. You can attach packet analyzers from here to your virtual networks, and then um, you can see, you can inspect the traffic that's uh, traversing, your, uh, traversing your virtual networks. So that's the monitor tab. Uh, similarly, you have the configure tab. So this is the equivalent of, if you, if you are familiar with the Junos router, there, are, there is a config mode and there is an operational mode. So the monitor corresponds to the operational mode. This is the config mode of uh, a, a typical router. Uh, so most of the work we will be doing today will be uh, underneath the networking and the services uh, sub-tabs. So you can look at the networks and you can spawn your network over here. So let, let's everyone browse to this uh, tab, to this sub-tab, the network sub-tab under networking in the configure tab of the Contrail UI. And then you can create the enterprise network and give it some suffix, maybe give it your sandbox number as a suffix so that you can easily identify your enterprise network. So I'm going to call it enterprise demo. For now, we'll leave the policy blank. So when we are spawning the virtual network, we'll leave the policy blank and give it some private IP block. It populates the gateway address. Add that um, IP block. And that's it. Hit save. So as you can see, my enterprise demo virtual network was created. So let us all, I, I, I'll, I'll give a couple minutes for everyone to spawn your enterprise networks. So, I'm sorry, how do you specify the block? Do you give the two endpoints or do you do a slash? You give a slash. Um, it's the password that's the problem? If you're not using network,
there's an administrator. I, I'll ask him to increase the number of sessions. So here's what you do. You go to the Configure tab. Okay. Under Configure, you browse to Networking. Under Networking, there's Networks. Okay. Yeah, I got it. And then on the right-hand side, on the top right-hand side, there's a Create button. Got it. And for now, when you create the virtual network, leave the policies blank. Okay. Give it some IP block, like 192.168.11.0.24. Yes. I know some of you are having problems connecting to the lab or um, I've, I've already communicated with the administrator to increase the number of sessions for, the, for those who are having problems with the number of sessions. But in the interest of time, we'll have to make progress. For those people who are already connected, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make some progress. Also, we don't see public, we see a sandbox. Exactly. So, so what we've done is, because there are multiple sandboxes, in each of the DCs, there are about 20 sandboxes. And so what we've done is the, the public block of IP addresses, instead of a slash 24, we've split that slash 24 into slash 29s so that you know, each, each sandbox has their own public. It, it's the same thing. Instead of a public, it's called sandbox dash public. So, so the next step we do is we go to the Horizon UI and spawn a Ubuntu virtual machine inside your enterprise network. So we created the enterprise network, and now we are going to spawn the Ubuntu virtual machine inside this um, virtual network. So we go to the Horizon UI. Make sure you're logged into the same uh, sandbox. So the sandbox in Contrail maps to uh, a project or a tenant in the OpenStack UI. So I'm logged into the demo, and I'll launch an instance from an image. We've pre-populated glance with an Ubuntu image. I'll call it Enterprise Ubuntu Demo. Now, for the flavor, um, I suggest not using tiny and using at least a small, but, but keep it to a small. And then you have to select a network to put the first VNIC of the virtual machine inside. And so select the enterprise network that you just created. What that does is it puts the first NIC inside the enterprise demo virtual network and then simply launch the VM. So let's all do that second step. Launch a Ubuntu virtual machine from the Horizon UI and you select the enterprise virtual network you just created to put the first VNIC inside. <laughs> let, let me try to fix that.
Desktop. So that login information is here. No, it should work. Yeah. So for spawning the Ubuntu virtual machine, let's use the Ubuntu image. And then once you create the virtual machine, once you, you can log into the console. So the login for that is just Ubuntu, Ubuntu. If you're using a different image, then the login information is mentioned on your uh, handout. No, use a small. And then you can do an IF config. And you will see that the ETH0 interface will have an IP address from the virtual network, the subnet block that you uh, allocated for the virtual network. And we will try to ping Google's public DNS server. And clearly, it will not have access. We'll not be able to ping uh, 8888. So the next step we are going to do, so now we have two separate isolated virtual networks. There is a public network and there is an enterprise network. The enterprise network has one virtual machine. And the next step we need to do is to apply policy in order to connect these virtual networks. So, so the next step is to create a policy. Just delete the VM and try spawning another one.
So some users do have access to the lab and are, are not having problems and are moving ahead. So in the interest of time, let me also show um, what, what the next steps are on the screen. So the next step you're going to do is, because these two networks are isolated, you have to create a policy and then apply that policy to the two networks. So, so that's what I'm going to do. So, so as you can see in the diagram, you first create the policy. And then the next step you do is attach the policy to the two networks. So I'm going to do these two steps in the Contrail UI. Create the policy and then attach it. So I go to my Contrail UI, go to the Configure tab again, and under the Networking, there is now a Policies sub-tab. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to say Enterprise Internet Policy. And then I save from the source network, enterprise demo. Destination network is demo public. So this simply creates the policy. And you can see there is a second column called Associated Networks. So that Associated Networks is right now blank. So you might wonder why there is a two-step process. First you create the policy, and then you attach the policy. This is because the policies may be created by one set of security personnel, and then the application of the policy may be uh, by other set of administrators. So that's why there is a clean separation of who creates the policies and then who uses those policies and applies those policies to the networks. Um, so we've created, these, we've created this policy, and right now it's not associated with any networks. You can see the second column blank. So you go to the networks. And remember, when we created the network, we left the policy field blank. So we go back to the network. We edit the network. And then you select the policy that you just created, and then you apply that policy. Similarly, you go to the demo public. We had applied the firewall policy. I'll now take out the firewall policy and simply apply the enterprise internet policy that I just created. So I've now applied the policy on both the networks, and thus I've, I'm, I'm connected to, I, I have connected the enterprise network to the public network. Yes. But, but this still is not going to apply NAT for all traffic going from the enterprise towards, uh, if my ping packets are sent directed to 8888, uh, this policy is not going to apply NAT yet. So I have to spawn the NAT service instance and then insert that service instance in, into this policy. So before I do that, let, let me give a few minutes for everyone to, to create the policy and then attach the policy to the two virtual networks to connect the two virtual networks. I don't see it. If I go to network, nothing. If I go back to to OpenStack, I can see the network that I have created in Contrail. Really? Yeah. I, I, in, in OpenStack, are you on the sandbox one? Sandbox one, and I, I created the network in uh, in Contrail. 
and I created the policy in control, but mm -hmm. I cannot see it there. I only see it in open sky UI. And Which I was able to here. attach it here. Maybe something to the uh, web. Uh, no, um, uh, it might be some of the daemons might might have uh, mm, might need to be restarted on the um, on the server. I was able to attach and do this, and now I'm like the server. Like around, like around. The weird thing is, I'm not I seeing any I of the problems. I cannot, I cannot see it. I cannot see it in control. Okay. I only see it in open sky. Okay. So the thing is, both are working off of the same database, so you should be able to see uh, from both UIs. So, so there was a question asking me whether there was a map of the topology I've just created. So you just saw what I did was I created the enterprise virtual network and then applied a policy to connect the enterprise to the public network. So, so let's see how that uh, shows up, uh, how, how that is pictorially represented. So because that's like a monitoring kind of functionality, I have to go to the monitor tab. And under the monitor tab, I'll go to the networking. I'll go to the list of networks and I'll search for my enterprise network, which I created in the demo sandbox. Enterprise demo is what I created. And you can see enterprise demo is connected to demo public simply by a direct policy. Right now, there is no service instance inside or uh, uh, between the two virtual networks. So, so this is um, the map that uh, there was a question for. You go to the monitor UI, under networking, go to the list of networks, select the network within the sandbox that you um, are using, and then you will see that, you'll also see the traffic statistics at the bottom. So I'll go back to my slides and go back to the next step. Creating the policy, uh, the dropdown will list uh, the networks from all the sandboxes. But the networks in your sandbox will not be a fully qualified name. It will just be the name of the virtual network. For all other sandboxes, it has a fully qualified name. So it will have the prefix of the, of the sandbox and then the virtual network. So the networks in your sandbox will not have a prefix of the sandbox itself. Yeah, because our enterprise demo, there is no no enterprise demo. I found it in my sandbox. Yeah, I found it in my sandbox. Yeah. So the next step is uh, actually inserting the NAT service. But in order to insert the NAT service, I have to first spawn the NAT service, right? I have to first spawn a virtual machine and inside the virtual machine run the NAT service. And then I can insert it into, uh, into this policy. And so all traffic going from the enterprise network will be subjected to the NAT. So in order to do that, there's a two or three step process. The first thing you have to do is you have to create a template of the service that you are going to spawn. And when I say a, a template of the service, it simply um, identifies what image is going to be used to spawn the service. 
Um, and some other parameters like what mode the service is in. Is it an L2 service? Is it an L3 service? Um, and then um, what interfaces the service is going to have. So you create a service template before spawning an instance off of that template. So after you create the service template, you instantiate um, an instance from that service template. So the next step is to create a service instance from that template. So, so the next step is to create a service instance. In order to create the service instance, you, um, you use the service template, and then you specify which networks the left and right interfaces are going to be connected to. And if you want uh, the service to be also managed, you'll also put the management interface into some network. And then finally, you will edit the policy and then insert the service inside the policy. So that's what you will do uh, for the service insertion workflow. So I'm going to do these two steps, create the service template, create a service instance, and then include it inside a policy. I'll show it in, uh, in my uh, browser. So I go back to the configure UI. I go to the networking, I, I go to the services section this time. I create service template. So for my NAT service, a template is already created. Um, in any case, I'll just create a new one. I'll call it a NAT demo template. Now the NAT service is actually going to modify packets. It's actually going to do the source NAT functionality. And therefore, it's actually an in-network NAT kind of service. So that's the service mode you will select. And for the image, you'll simply use the NAT-service image, the NAT-service. And then there are going to be three interfaces. The, the service is going to be connected to two networks, to the enterprise network and the public network. So it needs two interfaces, a left and a right. And then if the service itself needs to be managed, uh, then you will also need a management interface. So let's have three interfaces in the template. And then you save the template. So I just created the NAT demo template. And then once you create the template, you create an instance from that template. So you create an instance called NAT instance, or I could give it a different name. I could call it an internet access instance. I use the NAT demo template that I just created. Now, in this case, the NAT service is already pre-configured, and there is zero configuration or zero management I'm going to have to do to this NAT service. And so I leave the management interface auto-configured. I'll put the left network, I'll put the left interface in my demo, uh, in, in my enterprise network. Which is, which is my enterprise demo network. And then the right interface, I'll put it on my public network. So I need my demo public. And then I save it. When I save it, what's going to happen is a virtual machine is going to be spawned with the NAT service image. And then it's going to, be, um, it's going to have two interfaces, the left and the right, um, in the two networks. So while the VM is uh, spawning, I know a few folks are ahead of the um, session. So if you're done doing exercise one, uh, please do uh, raise your hands. I'll come and uh, pick up your business card or name for the Apple iP iPad drawing. And we are kind of running out of time, so we'll wrap it up in five minutes. We are almost done with the demo. So as soon as the instance is spawned, merely spawning the instance and putting it in the two virtual networks does not route traffic through that service instance. You have to actually include that service instance inside a policy. The policy that we just created, we will go back to the policy, we will edit the policy, and then include the application of the NAT service inside that policy. So I'll go to 10, 10, 11, 11. I go to the policies. I created this enterprise internet policy. I edit the policy and say apply service.
So it shows me the list of services that are available to be included. And so you include the internet access service that you just created, save it in the policy. The policy is already applied to the two networks. So now if you go back to your Ubuntu virtual machine and try to ping 8888, the, the ping packets will be subjected to the NAT service, source NAT will be applied, and that is how uh, access to the internet will be enabled. I think that's pretty much all we wanted to cover in the hands-on. So uh, we will come around and take your business cards for uh, Apple iPad drawing. I know some of you had uh, connectivity issues. I just wanted to let you know that the lab is available for the next 10 days. So save the sandbox information. You can go back home and try the rest of the exercises uh, leisurely. Yes. yes. Oh, absolutely. So, so w here's what I did. There are three things I did. I created a service template, and then I instantiated using the service template instance, and then embed the service instance inside a policy. So to do that, I went back to my policies tab. I edited the policy, and I said apply service. There's an apply service checkbox. And then there is a and there is a drop down that allows me to select the services I want to apply. So one more minute. We will, uh, if anyone else wants to enter into the app, Apple iPad drawing, please raise your hand. This is So in order to be fair, what we'll do is people who have written their names on white paper, we'll put it on one of our business cards and put a number behind them so that when you draw it, <laughs> there is no partiality. Right? Good, good so idea. can you can you can you give me a few business cards? Uh, so we're gonna fully randomize here. Fully randomized here. Yeah. Try to be as fair as we can. One last thing is uh, you'll find folks from Juniper Contrail uh, in the summit. So if you have further questions about the product or about any of the features, please feel free to uh, contact any of us. You, you saw uh, our team members uh, in the room. So please feel free to contact any of us. You do? I have. Yeah, oh. can you get me a back <laughs>
you know, inside a Ubuntu VM or on your laptop. And we'll be, we'll be making these slides available. Um, so there's, there's this uh, page we've created on Etherpad. Uh, it's called contrail-devstack. to volunteer? Anyone, anyone wants to volunteer? As long as you don't know the texture of your own card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just a second. <laughs> so, I'm not in there, so. You're not in there? Uh, okay. Okay, so let, let's actually put it like this. Oh, no. Why don't you put your put hand, hand on there? Just, just hand uh, throw away the that? first three. Yeah. Three of us? No, I mean, no, one oh. of them, but throw away the first three. Oh, it's from Cisco. Judy Ann Connery. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we can keep this business card. <laughs> We're pretty generous. <laughs> <laughs>